So hello and welcome to another Wednesday webinar for North Dakota's Envirothon. My name is Beth Hill and I'm the Outreach and Education Manager for the North Dakota Forest Service. I'm joined by Rob Schilling. He works for the North, or excuse me, the U.S. Forest Service. It's always confusing. Uh, do you want to say anything about yourself, Rob? Uh, yeah, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for letting me join you. And, and Beth, I appreciate you putting this on. My name is Rob Schilling. I work with the Envirothon Committee and uh, my full time job is I'm the Recreation Program Manager for the for uh, the US Forest Service here in North Dakota. So excited to, to be here and, and participate in today's training. Always good to have more free people on the Envirothon Committee. Um, so today we're here to talk about how to identify different conifer tree species. So our conifers are in a group called gymnosperms and trees are generally split up into those two broad groups. We have our gymnosperms and we have our angiosperms. Our gymnosperms are a taxonomic class that includes plants whose seeds are not enclosed within an ovule. And the, the word gymnosperm is actually translated meaning naked seed. And so our gymnosperms include most evergreen tree species such as pines, spruces, firs, some gymnosperms, including larch and ginkgo, actually don't lose, do lose their leaves in the winter. And gymnosperms, a lot of times they're called conifers since many of them produce seeds and cones, as well as softwood since many of them have softer woods. So gymnos gymnosperms are actually really amazing. Some of the oldest and largest organisms in the entire world are included within this phyla. We have Methuselah, a 4,854-year-old Great Basin bristlecone pine tree growing high in the White Mountains of Inyo County in Eastern California. It's recognized as the non-clonal tree with the largest confirmed age in the world. We also have the General Sherman tree, a giant sequoia, as the world's largest tree measured by volume. It stands at 275 feet tall and is over three, 36 feet in diameter at the base. And it's estimated to be around 2,200 to 2,700 years old. And then we have Ginkgo biloba. It's the only remaining species of the Ginkgo phytophyllum. The Ginkgo biloba tree is one of the oldest living tree species in the world. It's the sole survivor of that ancient group of trees that date back to before dinosaurs even roamed the earth creatures that live between 245 and 66 million years ago. It's so ancient, we actually call this species a, a living fossil. So gymnosperms, they're really, really cool. Um, obviously, we don't see a lot of big famous trees like that here in North Dakota. Our climate, our soils and landscapes can be kind of challenging for trees to grow in, but conifers uh, being the dominant plant of the gymnosperms, they generally do pretty well in environments where the weather is cold and dry. So hello, that's us. Today we are going to touch on some of the conifer species that can be found in North Dakota and then how to identify them. So these are the two families of conifers that we will be focusing on. And this is by no means a comprehensive list. Um, if a genus on this page is bolded, we do have these growing in North Dakota. That would include our pines, spruce and large in the pine family and juniper and arborvitae in our cypress family. If a genus is italicized, that means that I have seen these type of trees grow in North Dakota, but they are not very extensive or um, able to live in our conditions at all. But uh, we do see some of these trees growing in North Dakota. We'll talk about how to identify uh, between the different types of trees. So there are a lot of things that we can do to determine what type of tree we have, but the best is by far looking at our leaves. The first obvious distinction between trees, which will usually be the first step when we're going through a dichotomous key, uh, like you guys will often see at the Envirothon competition, is if we have needles or if we have broadleaf leaves. In conifers, leaves remain on the tree year round and are replaced slowly and continuously rather than all at once like a deciduous tree. Uh, this is handy when we are having a competition in May when a lot of the deciduous trees may not have their leaves fully out yet. And so uh, if you do have a conifer that you're trying to identify, uh, it's kind of a, a gift that we have given you. Um, the smaller, tighter needles are more waterproof and wind tight than the larger, wider leaves found on broadleaf or deciduous trees. Needles are generally less tasty to insects and therefore harder to destroy. Conifers do not need a big boost of nutrients for spring growth for leaves 
and can survive in a lot poorer soils with a lot less water. That's why we often see them growing in these tough climates and habitats. Conifer tree ID is also possible by looking at things like the cones, the branches, and through these things, we're gonna be able to spot some subtle differences. So all conifers have two types of cones. We have our pollen cones and our seed cones. The male cones, which are pollen cones, are similar on all conifer species and are smaller than the female ones, which are our seed cones. The seed cones are usually woody and brown and can be useful in the identification of conifer species. And conifer cones are made up of scales that grow out of a center stalk. So we're gonna go into that a little bit further here. So first we have our pines. Pine needles grow in clusters on a branch, which helps us to determine uh, what type of pine we have. Uh, these clusters or bunches, we call those fascicles. In pine trees, we have two needle pines, we have three needle pines and five needle pines. Uh, very often our pine needle clusters are arranged spirally on the branch. You will notice the buds of needles are held together on the branch with what looks like a little piece of black tape wrapped around the base of those needles. Um, and that's what we call that fascicle, that little bundle um, of all those twigs put together, or excuse me, all those needles put together. Our pine needles tend to be longer than our spruce and our fir needles, and our cones are made of dense woody material. First up, we have one of our native pines in North Dakota, and that is our ponderosa pine. Pinus ponderosa is the taxonomic name. It's a large tree native to southwestern North Dakota that is pyramidal when it's young, and it becomes irregularly oblong and open crowned with age. It's fairly drought tolerant and does well on a variety of soils in shelter belts and urban areas. Our native ponderosa pine stand is the most northeastern stand in the contiguous U.S. Uh, we have a ponderosa pine stand that is found in the very southwest part of the state. Um, our fire management team here at the North Dakota Forest Service, we actually do a lot of hazardous fuels reductions in this ponderosa pine stand, so it's kind of near and dear to my agency's heart. Uh, ponderosa pines are easily recognized by their tall, straight, thick trunks clad in scaled, rusty orange bark that has split into big plates as they get older. One can easily identify some trees by spelling their bark. Um, I've heard that ponderosa pine bark smells like vanilla or butterscotch, though I can't say that I've really experienced that. Uh, with our ponderosa pines, we have fascicles that have either two or three needles kind of scattered throughout the, the canopy. These needles are longer than most other pine trees. They're about four to nine inches long. And we have larger cones that are about three to five inches long. And what's kind of diagnostic about our ponderosa pine cones is that they have a really sharp prickle at the end of each scale. And that is shown here in this picture. Next up, we have our other native pine in North Dakota. That is uh, the limber pine. Pinus flexilis. Uh, it's native to a very limited area in southwestern North Dakota from seed carried to this site by early Native Americans. It generally does poorly in other parts of the state overall. This pine has five needles per fascicle with needles that are two and a half to three and a half inches long, so a little bit shorter than our ponderosa. It has very flexible twigs, which helps make this tree more resilient under the weight of heavy snow. And that's where we get our taxonomic name, Pinus flexilis. The bark is pale gray and smooth, and often you'll see it look like a bunch of bunch up needles at the branch tips. You can see that in the picture here. Uh, if you look at this main picture of the tree, you can see that it's kind of scattered throughout those little bunches of needles. Um, and as for cones, it's not uncommon to see some resin on the tips of these cone scales, and they are more long and skinny than the ponderosa pine cone, and they have a very distinctive light brown tan color. You can see that right here. And then I'll touch on one non-native pine that we have. Uh, it is our Scotch pine. It's often called Scots pine too, and it's native to Eurasia. These trees generally have two needles, always have two needles per fascicle. These needles are a lot shorter, about one, one and a half to three and a half inches long. The cones are also smaller and a kind of a dull gray brown color. Uh, which point back to the base of the branch. And these are very common in our wind break, wind break plantings and also used in urban plantings. Um, another thing to note is with the scotch pines, you'll notice that if you go up the 
the tree, you'll notice a lot of the bark is kind of this orange, orangey color. And it's kind of flaky as well. If I go to my next picture, you can see this very distinctive orange color. Generally, when I look at scotch pines, I notice they're a little less full than other types of pines. Um, and so that's just one thing that I look at when I'm trying to identify a tree as well. So this is a, a nice picture that illustrates the different pine cones that we can see. Um, not all of them are found in North Dakota, obviously. So we are going to look at these two on the right. Uh, the pine cone we have on the left here is from Pinus ponderosus or a ponderosa pine. You notice how much larger it is than the Scots pine cone to the right of it, uh, that Pinus sylvestris, that Scotch pine. And you can see here in this ponderosa pine, again, those really sharp points on the end of those cone scales. So if you're identifying a tree using a dichotomous key, sometimes looking around on the ground for some fallen cones will be able to help you um, and help to kind of figure out what kind of tree you're looking at. So that is our pines, fast and furious. Next we have our spruce trees. Spruce trees can be identified by their needles that have four sides, so they're kind of square shaped. Um, each needle is individually attached to the branch and can be rolled easily between your fingers. Another way to identify spruce trees is by the cones. They're covered in these smooth, thin scales, and it's it's quite easy to bend the cones of spruce trees. Spruce needles are short and stiff, whereas pine needles are longer and softer. And you can also tell spruce trees apart from pine trees by looking at the shape of the tree itself. Uh, spruce tree branches tend to have an upward growth in with a full bushy needle foliage like you would see when you would imagine a Christmas tree. On the other hand, our pine tree branches have a downward growth habit and are less dense in foliage, and that's usually localized to the tips of the branches. So we'll see that here. In our first example of a spruce, we have our Colorado blue spruce, Picea pungens. Um, this tree we see a lot in windbreak plantings, a lot uh, around homes uh, to protect from the wind. The thing about these needles is they're very sharp and very pokey. If you guys have tried to run your, your hand over a, a, a Colorado blue spruce branch, you, it's not going to go very far because it's very sharp and very pointy. Um, often you'll see a very silvery blue color, though that's not always the case. These needles are about three quarters of an inch to one and a quarter inches long, and the cones are about three inches long. So they're a little bit longer than we see than this other spruce I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, and the thing that is diagnostic about these cones on our Colorado blue spruce is that the cone scales are kind of square shaped and have this ragged edge to them. So you can see it's kind of wavy here on the tip of that cone scale. That is very diagnostic of that Colorado blue spruce. And again, you can see that kind of Christmas tree shape in this right picture here. Uh, when we look at the twigs of Colorado blue spruce, they're going to be hairless and they're going to be a kind of a red color as well. We'll get into that in a little bit. The other spruce we're looking at today is Black Hill spruce. It's also called white spruce and the taxonomic name is Picea glauca. Uh, with these trees, they have needles that are more dark green to blue green, uh, can vary. These needles are somewhat rigid. They're a little bit shorter than we see with our Colorado blue spruce, so a third to a quarter or three quarters of an inch long. And our cones are smaller with rounded scales. You guys can see here we have our Black Hill spruce cones. You notice that the cone scales are more rounded. Um, than you would see with the Colorado blue spruce. And you see that quarter there for scale. So just seeing like how small these cones can actually be. And this is the picture here I got from NDSU Extension, just showing the um, side by side of both the twigs of these two different trees. So we see the Black Hill spruce having more, um, they're definitely hairless. Both of them are hairless as far as the twigs, but the Black Hill spruce is more light colored, kind of whitish where Colorado blue is more red. And we notice just how much longer the needles are with the Colorado blue than with the Black Hill spruce. And again, with the size and shape of the cones right side by side. And this again here is a picture depicting the, the cones. You don't have to be a cone expert to identify a spruce, but uh, these are just some of the things that we as foresters use to identify different trees. On the right here, we have our um, Colorado blue spruce again, 
And then in the box on the left, we have our Black Hill spruce just in comparison with the size of those cones. Next up, we have our larches or the Larix genus. Our larches are actually our only deciduous conifer. They're characterized by 15 to 30 soft, short needles arranged in tufts from woody pegs along the branches. So if you guys can see my pointer here, in this photo on the left, you notice that there's these little wooden pegs and out of those little wooden pegs, you see many different needles coming from that one central location. Not as very typical of larches. Uh, I said they're deciduous and so they actually do lose their needles each year. You can see uh, they're very apparent in the fall when they start to change this brilliant yellow color. And then often I get a lot of questions through the winter like, oh my gosh, my pine tree died. And um, I will have somebody send a picture of this and I'll be like, first of all, it doesn't look like a pine tree. I think they mean they think it's a spruce tree. Um, and then I, I look closer and I notice these woody pegs on the on the branches and the twigs and that tells me oh it's a large tree that is just you know dormant for this for the winter and so it can look like a dead tree in the winter but it's actually alive and it will uh, sprout again with some needles um, our large trees are usually conical pyramidal in growth um, like you can see in the this picture here um, like other conifer species these trees thrive in cold and freezing temperatures our large trees don't have flowers, but they have small male and female immature flower-like seed cones called strobili, and they're made up of scaly bracts growing from the same tree. So this is a picture of that strobili. Um, in larches, sometimes they'll be like this brilliant pink color. And then it will. we have our uh, seed cones as well here on the left. They're a lot smaller than our other, like our spruce cones, and sometimes they'll have rounded cone scales on these um, large trees. And then this is kind of a neat photo. I don't know if you've seen this before, but uh, you can have a little bit of fun with the fact that these trees change color in the fall. Uh, for this particular planting, somebody did uh, a smiley face design using evergreen trees that actually stay green all year round. And then the uh, large trees that actually turn yellow in the fall, um, th that's what you see making up the smiley face. So just kind of a cool, cool little uh, effect that you can see that fact that they're deciduous. Okay, so going on to our cypress family, we have our junipers. We first have our Rocky Mountain juniper, Juniperus scopulorum. I'm not great at taxonomic names, even though I did take Latin in high school. This tree uh, is usually narrow, pyramidal to rounded in form, and it grows 30 to 40 feet tall. It has shedding reddish brown bark and has silvery bluish to dark green scale-like foliage that lies flat against the branches. The Rocky Mountain juniper prefers full sun, moist, well-drained soils, and especially does well in dry, sandy soil. It's very drought tolerant, salt tolerant, erosion tolerant. It's a very hardy tree species we have here in North Dakota. Um, and that's why a lot of people use it in their windbreaks. It's an excellent species for that. The thing about junipers is it has these little um, modified cones that are kind of in a, a berry structure. And that is a lot of uh, good food for those wildlife, those birds and other animals that we have out there. And then when crushed, the berries are actually really aromatic. They have a really nice scent to them. And they smell just like gin, which you guys probably shouldn't know the smell of because you're not 21 yet. But junipers are actually used to make gin. And so that's kind of a cool little fun fact. Next, we have our eastern red cedar. So Rocky Mountain juniper is native to North Dakota. Um, this one is a little complicated because it's called Eastern Red Cedar, but it's not actually a cedar. It's actually more like a cousin to our Rocky Mountain Juniper. It's in the same genus that Juniperus virginiana is its taxonomic name. Again, it has those scale-like needles. The, the main difference between our Rocky Mountain Juniper and our Eastern Red Cedar is that these type of trees often have a brownish tint to the needle color in the winter, whereas our uh, Rocky Mountain Junipers, they stay kind of that bluish green tint uh, throughout the year. These are also very tolerant to a lot of types of soils and conditions. Uh, they'll basically almost grow anywhere. Um, 
One thing that I noticed about eastern red cedar is that when the foliage is really young, sometimes it'll be really spiky, like it's pictured here, not quite scaly, more spiky. But as the, the foliage matures, it turns into that more scale-like structure. And with eastern red cedar, I thought it's important to mention that uh, in the Ojibwe culture, it is one of their four sacred medicines. It's used as a spiritually purifying herb in many ceremonies and prayer. They also use re eastern red cedar for arrows used to hunt waterfowl since that wood is used. Uh, it uh, floats on water, so it's a really good, good one for hunting waterfowl. This plant was also used medicinally by the Dakota people who made a decon decoction of fruits and leaves to treat coughs. And the bruised leaves and berries were often used to treat headaches as well. So this is just a picture depicting uh, the two species side by side. Um, on the left, we have our eastern red cedar in the winter. It has that kind of brownish tint to its foliage. And on the right hand side, we have a Rocky Mountain juniper having more of that uh, bluish, bluish green tint to it. These both do produce berries. They look very similar. Um, I've been a forester for a few years now, but even I sometimes have issues um, comparing the two and figuring out which one is which. Uh, and that's why it's kind of nice that in the North Dakota Envirothon, we do have our competition in May. You will kind of see some of these colors lingering. And so that could be a helpful thing to use and on your dichotomous key. In the Cypress family, we also have what's called Arborvitae, or Thuya occidentalis. Um, this one has flattened scale-like needles. Those needles are flattened. Um, um, and we notice it has small flower-shaped cones. This tree is often used uh, in like a hedge function uh, for some privacy. It's really resilient to shaping and shearing. The leaves change from bright green in the summer to a multitude of rich yellow-brown green hues in the winter. Um, this is often called deer candy because deers really love to browse it and eat it to the detriment of the the, the homeowner usually get a lot of issues with it. Um, again, these, when crushed, the needles will produce a really aromatic cedar smell. Um, and this tree in Ojibwe is considered important to the, that indigenous culture for many purposes. Burned twigs were used as incense in religious ceremonies and as disinfectant to fumigate a house for smallpox. The cedar compound containing charcoal was pricked into the temples with needles for headaches. A compound containing leaves was used as a cough syrup, and the leaves were used in an infusion of decoction for headaches, coughs, and as a blood purifier. All right, we're going back into the pine family. So these are not very common in North Dakota, but I thought it would be important to kind of touch on these a little bit. We have our firs. So I'm just gonna to touch on one example of a true fir. So firs are often used as Christmas trees throughout the world. Uh, a lot of Christmas tree farms grow different types of firs. Balsam fir is the most common Christmas type Christmas tree. Uh, but in North Dakota, there's actually one small localized uh, stand of white fir that is from an unknown seed source that has performed really well at the Bowman Haley Reservoir, southeast of Bowman, North Dakota. Uh, a few other sources have been planted in North Dakota, but really suffer from a lack of hardiness and winter burns. So we're not really sure why these trees will grow in that one site, but it's kind of cool to, to think about. So with our firs, our, our leaves are needle-like. They're single on the branch. And what's unique about them is they're usually flattened. Um, with the white fir, they're one and a half to two inches long with the apex or the tip of that needle uh, being rounded. With the white fir, it's very blue-gray to grayish-green in color with pale bluish bands beneath the needle. Our needles are arranged in a spiral around the twig and are often curved upward with the white fir. Um, with our true firs, we see the needles look suction cup to the branch almost. Uh, there's a very definite distinction between the needle itself and the branch. And so I'll just show a picture here. You can kind of see it where we have our branch right here. And you notice it's this really distinct round border between the needle itself and the branch. And with our white fur, with all furs, we have our cones being upright 
on the branch, which is very unique uh, among our conifers. And they're often like a blue to purplish color when they're immature, which is kind of cool to see as well. When I look at uh, fir cones, they look kind of funny to me. It's almost like you had an expert at the Dairy Queen that was just doing layer of layer upon ice cream on top of each other. Um, and so we, we just see that with our fir trees. Next, I have what's called a false fir. So we call it a Douglas fir, but it's actually not in the same genus as our other firs, which is our abies. Uh, but this tree is called Douglas fir. It's in Pseudosuga menziesi. I probably just butchered that. Um, we, again, we see those flat linear needles that are very soft and flexible, just like our other firs. Uh, but the main characteristic that's different between our false firs and our true firs is that tapered connection between the needle and the branch. Um, I'll let show that in the next slide here. Uh, one thing I'll point out, a Douglas fir is very diagnostic if you have the cone alongside it. Um, those bracts or these little, um, almost like, I like to call it like a forked tip or like a, a snake tongue almost. These bracts, these little pieces that come off those cone scales, we, we only see that with our Douglas fir. And so that is a, a very characteristic um, diagnostic piece of a Douglas fir is those cones. Okay, so now I have our photo. On the left, we have a true fir, and on the right, we have our Douglas fir. You can see here on that true fir, again, it almost looks like a rounded suction cup, just kind of, oopsie, suctioned on that little twig on that branch. Whereas when we look at this Douglas fir on the right, especially right here, you can see it's almost tapered to like a smaller point on that twig. And that is really the best way you can tell the difference between a false fir and a true fir, unless you have that cone, obviously that's gonna be a Douglas fir. Um, but yeah, that is all I have for now. Are there any questions in the chat, Rob? I kind of just went on a bunch and I'm, prob I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Yeah, no questions in the chat right now, um, but feel free if you have questions, you can either enter them in the chat or, or uh, raise your hand and, and I'll call on you. Yeah. Going to throw some resources for you guys in the chat, and we're also going to be sending this out as part of the email. Uh, the first is Project Learning Tree, which is a curriculum that uh, my agency delivers to educators. There's also resources out there for students, um, but this one's more so for your teachers. Uh, it teaches you about the importance of trees and forestry and ties a bunch of activities that relate to forestry into the curriculum that you already have in the classroom. It's correlated to those standards. Uh, the next one is a dichotomous key example that you guys could possibly use at the state competition or regional competition, whatever you guys are preparing for. I'm also including the North Dakota Tree Handbook, which includes a lot of species that uh, grow in North Dakota, become familiar with some of these. The more you know about North Dakota trees, the better I think you're going to do on the on the trail test here in May. Um, I'm also including the North Dakota Tree Selector. This one is a little prettier. It's got a, a nice little tool that NDSU put together where you can select for things like, is it a conifer or is it a decidu deciduous tree? Uh, do you want, you know, red fall color do you want it to be a good tree under utility lines those type of things and then my last resource is an ndsu extension um, publication called pines for north dakota it touches on the ponderosa the limber and the scots pine and then it also includes a couple more that are less commonly found in north dakota but who knows you could always be tested on something like that. So these will be great resources for you guys as you study and prep up for the forestry section on the trail test for the competition. Are there any other questions? It was a fast one today. I just talk really fast, I guess. Anything you wanna add, Rob? Uh, no, Beth, I think you did a, a great job covering that. Lots of information coming at you folks, so please use the resources listed on the North Dakota Envirothon website, as long as the stuff that Beth is going to uh, to send you and has posted in the chat. And um, I guess, as always, if you have questions that, that come up later, uh, later tonight or, or next week as you guys are studying, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, to one of us. We'd be happy to help you um, prepare for the upcoming Envirothon.
You just put my email in the chat if you want to do the same, Rob. That would be great. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining, guys. I hope you learned something. One thing I always say to students in my career, in my lifetime, I'm trying to teach a generation that understands that not all evergreen trees are pine trees. And so hopefully today I, I instilled that in you guys a little bit. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. Have a great day.